chapter four of abraham lincoln a history volume ten this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org abraham lincoln a history volume ten by john hay and john george nicolay chapter four the thirteenth amendment we have enumerated with some detail the series of radical anti-slavery measures enacted at the second session of the thirty-seventh congress which ended july seventeenth eighteen sixty two the abolition of slavery in the district of columbia the prohibition of slavery in the national territories the practical repeal of the fugitive slave law and the sweeping measures of confiscation which in different forms decreed forfeiture of slave property for the crimes of treason and rebellion when this wholesale legislation was supplemented by the president's preliminary emancipation proclamation of september twenty two eighteen sixty two and his final edict of freedom of january one eighteen sixty three the institution had clearly received its coup de grace in all except the loyal border states consequently the third session of the thirty seventh congress ending march fourth eighteen sixty three occupied itself with this phase of the slavery question only to the extent of an effort to put into operation the president's plan of compensated abolishment that effort took practical shape in a bill to give the state of missouri fifteen millions on condition that she would emancipate her slaves but the proposition failed largely through the opposition of a few conservative members from missouri and the session adjourned without having by its legislation advanced the destruction of slavery when congress met again in december eighteen sixty three and organized by the election of schuyler colfax of indiana as speaker the whole situation had undergone further change the union arms had been triumphant gettysburg had been won and vicksburg had capitulated lincoln's edict of freedom had become an accepted fact fifty regiments of negro soldiers carried bayonets in the union armies vallandigham had been beaten for governor in ohio by a hundred thousand majority the draft had been successfully enforced in every district of every loyal state in the union under these brightening prospects military and political the more progressive spirits in congress took up anew the suspended battle with slavery which the institution had itself invited by its unprovoked assault on the life of the government the president's reference to the subject in his annual message was very brief the movements by state action for emancipation in several of the states not included in the emancipation proclamation are matters of profound gratulation and while i do not repeat in detail what i have heretofore so earnestly urged upon this subject my general views and feelings remain unchanged and i trust that congress will omit no fair opportunity of aiding these important steps to a great consummation his language had reference to maryland where during the autumn of eighteen sixty three the question of emancipation had been actively discussed by political parties and where at the election of november fourth eighteen sixty three a legislature had been chosen containing a considerable majority pledged to emancipation more especially did it refer to missouri where notwithstanding the failure of the fifteen million compensation bill at the previous session a state convention had actually passed an ordinance of emancipation though with such limitations as rendered it unacceptable to the more advanced public opinion of the state prudence was the very essence of mr lincoln's statesmanship and he doubtless felt it was not safe for the executive to venture farther at that time we are like whalers he said to governor morgan one day who have been long on a chase we have at last got the harpoon into the monster but we must now look how we steer or with one flop of his tail he will send us all into eternity senators and members of the house especially those representing anti-slavery states or districts did not need to be so circumspect it was doubtless with this consciousness that j m ashley 
a republican representative from ohio and james f wilson a republican representative from iowa on the fourteenth of december eighteen sixty three that being the earliest opportunity after the house was organized introduced the former a bill and the latter a joint resolution to propose to the several states an amendment of the constitution prohibiting slavery throughout the united states both the propositions were referred to the committee on the judiciary of which mr wilson was chairman but before he made any report on the subject it had been brought before the senate where its discussion attracted marked public attention senator john b henderson who with rare courage and skill had as a progressive conservative made himself one of the leading champions of missouri emancipation on the eleventh of january eighteen sixty four introduced into the senate a joint resolution proposing an amendment to the constitution that slavery shall not exist in the united states it is not probable that either he or the senate saw any near hope of success in such a measure the resolution went to the committee on the judiciary apparently without being treated as a matter of pressing importance nearly a month had elapsed when mr sumner also introduced a joint resolution proposing an amendment that everywhere within the limits of the united states and of each state or territory thereof all persons are equal before the law so that no person can hold another as a slave he asked its reference to the select committee on slavery of which he was chairman but several senators argued that such an amendment properly belonged to the committee on the judiciary and in this reference mr sumner finally acquiesced it is possible that this slight and courteously worded rivalry between the two committees induced earlier action than would otherwise have happened for two days later lyman trumbull chairman of the judiciary committee reported back a substitute in the following language differing from the phraseology of both mr sumner and mr henderson article thirteen section one neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the united states or any place subject to their jurisdiction section two congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation even after the committee on the judiciary by this report had adopted the measure it was evidently thought to be merely in an experimental stage for more than six weeks elapsed before the senate again took it up for action on the twenty eighth of march however mr trumbull formally opened debate upon it in an elaborate speech the discussion was continued from time to time until the eighth of april as the republicans had almost unanimous control of the senate their speeches though able and eloquent seemed perfunctory and devoted to a foregone conclusion those which attracted most attention were the arguments of reverdy johnson of maryland and mr henderson of missouri senators representing slave states advocating the amendment senator sumner whose pride of erudition amounted almost to vanity pleaded earnestly for his phrase all persons are equal before the law copied from the constitution of revolutionary france but jacob m howard of michigan one of the soundest lawyers and clearest thinkers of the senate pointed out the inapplicability of the words and declared it safer to follow the ordinance of seventeen eighty seven with its historical associations and its well adjudicated meaning there was of course from the first no doubt whatever that the senate would pass the constitutional amendment the political classification of that body being thirty-six republicans five conditional unionists and nine democrats not only was the whole republican strength thirty-six votes cast in its favor but two democrats reverdy johnson of maryland and james w nesmith of oregon with a political wisdom far in advance of their party also voted for it giving more than the two-thirds required by the constitution when however the joint resolution went to the house of representatives there was such a formidable party strength arrayed against it as to foreshadow its failure the party classification of the house stood one hundred and two republicans seventy-five democrats and nine from the border states leaving but little chance of obtaining the required two-thirds vote in favor of the measure 
nevertheless there was sufficient republican strength to secure its discussion and when it came up on the thirty first of may the first vote showed seventy six to fifty five against rejecting the joint resolution we may infer that the conviction of the present hopelessness of the measure greatly shortened the debate upon it the question occupied the house only on three different days the thirty first of may when it was taken up and the fourteenth and fifteenth of june the speeches in opposition all came from democrats the speeches in its favor all came from republicans except one from its adoption the former predicted the direst evils to the constitution and the republic the latter the most beneficial results in the restoration of the country to peace and the fulfilment of the high destiny intended for it by its founders upon the final question of its passage the vote stood yeas ninety three nays sixty five absent or not voting twenty three of those voting in favor of the resolution eighty seven were republicans and four were democrats those voting against it were all democrats the resolution not having secured a two-thirds vote was thus lost seeing which mr ashley republican who had the measure in charge changed his vote so that he might if occasion arose move its reconsideration the ever vigilant public opinion of the loyal states intensified by the burdens and anxieties of the war took up this far-reaching question of abolishing slavery by constitutional amendment with an interest fully as deep as that manifested by congress before the joint resolution had failed in the house of representatives the issue was already transferred to discussion and prospective decision in a new forum when on the seventh of june eighteen sixty four the national republican convention met in baltimore the two most vital thoughts which animated its members were the renomination of mr lincoln and the success of the constitutional amendment the first was recognized as a popular decision needing only the formality of an announcement by the convention and the full emphasis of speech and resolution was therefore centred on the latter as the dominant and aggressive reform upon which the party would stake its political fortunes in the coming campaign it is not among the least of the evidences of president lincoln's political sagacity and political courage that it was he himself who supplied the spark that fired this train of popular action the editor of the new york independent who attended the convention and who with others visited mr lincoln immediately after the nomination printed the following in his paper of june sixteenth eighteen sixty four when one of us mentioned the great enthusiasm at the convention after senator e d morgan's proposition to amend the constitution abolishing slavery mr lincoln instantly said it was i who suggested to mr morgan that he should put that idea into his opening speech the declaration of morgan who was chairman of the national republican committee and as such called the convention to order immediately found an echo in the speech of the temporary chairman the rev dr robert j breckinridge the endorsement of the principle by the eminent kentucky divine not on the ground of party but on the high philosophy of true universal government and of genuine christian religion gave the announcement an interest and significance accorded to few planks in party platforms the permanent chairman william dennison reaffirmed the doctrine of morgan and breckinridge and the thunderous applause of the whole convention greeted the formal proclamation of the new dogma of political faith in the third resolution of the platform resolved that as slavery was the cause and now constitutes the strength of this rebellion and as it must be always and everywhere hostile to the principles of republican government justice and the national safety demand its utter and complete extirpation from the soil of the republic and that while we uphold and maintain the acts and proclamations by which the government in its own defence has aimed a death blow at this gigantic evil we are in favor furthermore of such an amendment to the constitution to be made by the people in conformity with its provisions as shall terminate and forever prohibit the existence of slavery within the limits or the jurisdiction of the united states 
we have related elsewhere how upon this and the other declarations of the platform the republican party went to battle and gained an overwhelming victory a popular majority of four a hundred and eleven thousand two hundred and eighty one an electoral majority of one hundred and ninety one and a house of representatives of a hundred and thirty eight unionists to thirty five democrats in view of this result the president was able to take up the question with confidence among his official recommendations and in the annual message which he transmitted to congress on the sixth of december eighteen sixty four he urged upon the members whose terms were about to expire the propriety of at once carrying into effect the clearly expressed popular will said he at the last session of congress a proposed amendment of the constitution abolishing slavery throughout the united states passed the senate but failed for lack of the requisite two-thirds vote in the house of representatives although the present is the same congress and nearly the same members and without questioning the wisdom or patriotism of those who stood in opposition i venture to recommend the reconsideration and passage of the measure at the present session of course the abstract question is not changed but an intervening election shows almost certainly that the next congress will pass the measure if this does not hence there is only a question of time as to when the proposed amendment will go to the states for their action and as it is to so go at all events may we not agree that the sooner the better it is not claimed that the election has imposed a duty on members to change their views or their votes any further than as an additional element to be considered their judgment may be affected by it it is the voice of the people now for the first time heard upon the question in a great national crisis like ours unanimity of action among those seeking a common end is very desirable almost indispensable and yet no approach to such unanimity is attainable unless some deference shall be paid to the will of the majority simply because it is the will of the majority in this case the common end is the maintenance of the union and among the means to secure that end such will through the election is most clearly declared in favor of such constitutional amendment on the fifteenth of december mr ashley gave notice that he would on the sixth of january eighteen sixty five call up the constitutional amendment for reconsideration and accordingly on the day appointed he opened the new debate upon it in an earnest speech general discussion followed from time to time occupying perhaps half the days of the month of january as at the previous session the republicans all favored while the democrats mainly opposed it but the important exceptions among the latter showed what immense gains the proposition had made in popular opinion and in congressional willingness to recognize and embody it the logic of events had become more powerful than party creed or strategy for fifteen years the democratic party has stood as sentinel and bulwark to slavery and yet despite its alliance and championship the peculiar institution was being consumed like dry leaves in the fire of war for a whole decade it had been defeated in every great contest of congressional debate and legislation it had withered in popular elections been paralyzed by confiscation laws crushed by executive decrees trampled upon by marching union armies more notable than all the agony of dissolution had come upon it in its final stronghold the constitutions of the slave states local public opinion had throttled it in west virginia in missouri in arkansas in louisiana in maryland and the same spirit of change was upon tennessee and even showing itself in kentucky here was a great revolution of ideas a mighty sweep of sentiment which could not be explained away by the stale charge of sectional fanaticism or by alleging technical irregularities of political procedure here was a mighty flood of public opinion overleaping old barriers and rushing into new channels the democratic party did not and could not shut its eyes to the accomplished facts in my judgment said william s holman of indiana the fate of slavery is sealed it dies by the rebellious hand of its votaries untouched by the law its fate is determined by the war by the measures of the war by the results of the war these sir must determine it even if the constitution were amended 
he opposed the amendment he declared simply because it was unnecessary though few other democrats were so frank all their speeches were weighed down by the same consciousness of a losing fight a hopeless cause the democratic leader of the house and lately defeated democratic candidate for vice-president george h pendleton opposed the amendment as he had done at the previous session by asserting that three-fourths of the states did not possess constitutional power to pass it this being if the paradox be excused at the same time the weakest and the strongest argument weakest because the constitution in terms contradicted the assertion strongest because under the circumstances nothing less than unconstitutionality could justify opposition but while the democrats as a party thus persisted in a false attitude more progressive members had the courage to take independent and wiser action not only did the four democrats moses f odell and john a griswold of new york joseph bailey of pennsylvania and ezra wheeler of wisconsin who supported the amendment at the first session again record their votes in its favor but they were now joined by thirteen others of their party associates namely augustus c baldwin of michigan alexander h coffroth and archibald mcallister of pennsylvania james e english of connecticut john ganson anson herrick homer a nelson william radford and john b steele of new york wells a hutchins of ohio austin a king and james s rollins of missouri and george h yeaman of kentucky and by their help the favorable two-thirds vote was secured but special credit for the result must not be accorded to these alone even more than of northern democrats must be recognized the courage and progressive liberality of members from the border slave states one from delaware four from maryland three from west virginia four from kentucky and seven from missouri whose speeches and votes aided the consummation of the great act and finally something is due to those democrats eight in number who were absent without pairs and thus perhaps not altogether by accident reduced somewhat the two-thirds vote necessary to the passage of the joint resolution mingled with these influences of a public and moral nature it is not unlikely that others of more selfish interest operating both for and against the amendment were not entirely wanting one who was a member of the house writes the success of the measure had been considered very doubtful and depended upon certain negotiations the result of which was not fully assured and the particulars of which never reached the public so also one of the president's secretaries wrote on the eighteenth of january i went to the president this afternoon at the request of mr ashley on a matter connecting itself with the pending amendment of the constitution the camden and amboy railroad interest promised mr ashley that if he would help postpone the raritan railroad bill over this session they would in return make the new jersey democrats help about the amendment either by their votes or absence sumner being the senate champion of the raritan bill ashley went to him to ask him to drop it for this session sumner however showed reluctance to adopt mr ashley's suggestion saying that he hoped the amendment would pass anyhow etc ashley thought he discerned in sumner's manner two reasons one that if the present senate resolution were not adopted by the house the senate would send them another in which they would most likely adopt sumner's own phraseology and thereby gratify his ambition and two that sumner thinks the defeat of the camden and amboy monopoly would establish a principle by legislative enactment which would effectually crush out the last lingering relics of the state's rights dogma ashley therefore desired the president to send for sumner and urge him to be practical and secure the passage of the amendment in the manner suggested by mr ashley i stated these points to the president who replied at once i can do nothing with mr sumner in these matters while mr sumner is very cordial with me he is making his history in an issue with me on this very point he hopes to succeed in beating the president so as to change this government from its original form and make it a strong centralized power then calling mr ashley into the room the president said to him i think i understand mr sumner and i think he would be all the more resolute in his persistence on the points which mr nicolay has mentioned to me if he supposed i were at all watching his course on this matter the issue was decided in the afternoon of the thirty first of january eighteen sixty five 
the scene was one of unusual interest the galleries were filled to overflowing the members watched the proceedings with unconcealed solicitude up to noon said a contemporaneous formal report the pro-slavery party are said to have been confident of defeating the amendment and after that time had passed one of the most earnest advocates of the measure said t is the toss of a copper there were the usual pleas for postponement and for permission to offer amendments or substitutes but at four o'clock the house came to a final vote and the roll-call showed yeas one hundred and nineteen nays fifty six not voting eight scattering murmurs of applause had followed the announcement of affirmative votes from several of the democratic members this was renewed when by direction of the speaker the clerk called his name and he voted aye but when the speaker finally announced the constitutional majority of two-thirds having voted in the affirmative the joint resolution is passed the announcement so continues the official report printed in the globe was received by the house and by the spectators with an outburst of enthusiasm the members on the republican side of the house instantly sprung to their feet and regardless of parliamentary rules applauded with cheers and clapping of hands the example is followed by the male spectators in the galleries which were crowded to excess who waved their hats and cheered loud and long while the ladies hundreds of whom were present rose in their seats and waved their handkerchiefs participating in and adding to the general excitement and intense interest of the scene this lasted for several minutes in honour of this immortal and sublime event cried eben c ingersoll of illinois i move that the house do now adjourn and against the objection of a maryland democrat the motion was carried by a yea and nay vote a salute of one hundred guns soon made the occasion the subject of comment and congratulation throughout the city on the following night a considerable procession marched with music to the executive mansion to carry popular greetings to the president in response to their calls mr lincoln appeared at a window and made a brief speech of which only an abstract report was preserved but which is nevertheless important as showing the searching analysis of cause and effect which this question had undergone in his mind the deep interest he felt in and the far-reaching consequences he attached to the measure and its success he supposed the passage through congress of the constitutional amendment for the abolishment of slavery throughout the united states was the occasion to which he was indebted for the honor of this call the occasion was one of congratulation to the country and to the whole world but there is a task yet before us to go forward and have consummated by the votes of the states that which congress has so nobly begun yesterday he had the honor to inform those present that illinois had already to-day done the work maryland was about half through but he felt proud that illinois was a little ahead he thought this measure was a very fitting if not an indispensable adjunct to the winding up of the great difficulty he wished the reunion of all the states perfected and so effected as to remove all causes of disturbance in the future and to attain this end it was necessary that the original disturbing cause should if possible be rooted out he thought all would bear him witness that he had never shrunk from doing all that he could do to eradicate slavery by issuing an emancipation proclamation but that proclamation falls far short of what the amendment will be when fully consummated a question might be raised whether the proclamation was legally valid it might be urged that it only aided those that came into our lines and that it was inoperative as to those who did not give themselves up or that it would have no effect upon the children of slaves born hereafter in fact it would be urged that it did not meet the evil but this amendment is a king's cure-all for all the evils it winds the whole thing up he would repeat that it was the fitting if not the indispensable adjunct to the consummation of the great game we are playing he could not but congratulate all present himself the country and the whole world upon this great moral victory widely divergent views were expressed by able constitutional lawyers in both branches of congress as to what in the anomalous condition of the country would constitute a valid ratification of the thirteenth amendment some contending that ratification by three-fourths of the loyal states would be sufficient others 
that three-fourths of all the states whether loyal or insurrectionary would be necessary we have seen that mr lincoln in his speech on louisiana reconstruction while expressing no opinion against the first proposition nevertheless declared with great argumentative force that the latter would be unquestioned and unquestionable and this view appears to have governed the action of his successor as mr lincoln mentioned with just pride in his address illinois was the first state to ratify the amendment taking her action on february one the day after the joint resolution was passed by the house of representatives and ratification by other states continued in the following order rhode island february two eighteen sixty five michigan february two eighteen sixty five maryland february three eighteen sixty five new york february three eighteen sixty five west virginia february three eighteen sixty five maine february seven eighteen sixty five kansas february seven eighteen sixty five massachusetts february eight eighteen sixty five pennsylvania february eight eighteen sixty five virginia february nine eighteen sixty five ohio february ten eighteen sixty five missouri february ten eighteen sixty five indiana february sixteen eighteen sixty five nevada february sixteen eighteen sixty five louisiana february seventeen eighteen sixty five minnesota february twenty three eighteen sixty five wisconsin march one eighteen sixty five vermont march nine eighteen sixty five tennessee april seven eighteen sixty five arkansas april twenty eighteen sixty five connecticut may five eighteen sixty five new hampshire july one eighteen sixty five south carolina november thirteen eighteen sixty five alabama december two eighteen sixty five north carolina december four eighteen sixty five georgia december nine eighteen sixty five oregon december eleven eighteen sixty five california december twenty eighteen sixty five florida december twenty eight eighteen sixty five new jersey january twenty three eighteen sixty six iowa january twenty four eighteen sixty six texas february eighteen eighteen seventy without waiting for the ratification by the last six of these states mr seward who remained as secretary of state in the cabinet of president johnson made official proclamation on december eighteen eighteen sixty five that the legislatures of twenty-seven states constituting three-fourths of the thirty-six states of the union had ratified the amendment and that it had become valid as a part of the constitution of the united states it needs to be noted that four of the states constituting this number of twenty-seven were virginia louisiana tennessee and arkansas whose reconstruction had been effected under the direction and by the authority of president lincoln the profound political transformation which the american republic had undergone can perhaps best be measured by contrasting for an instant the two constitutional amendments which congress made it the duty of the lincoln administration to submit officially to the several states the first was that offered by thomas corwin chairman of the committee of thirty three in february eighteen sixty one and passed by the house of representatives yeas one hundred and thirty three nays sixty five and by the senate yeas twenty four nays twelve it was signed by president buchanan as one of his last official acts and accepted and endorsed by lincoln in his inaugural address the language of that amendment was no amendment shall be made to the constitution which will authorize or give to congress the power to abolish or interfere within any state with the domestic institutions thereof including that of persons held to labor or service by the laws of said state between lincoln's inauguration and the outbreak of war the department of state under seward transmitted this amendment of eighteen sixty one to the several states for their action and had the south shown a willingness to desist from secession and accept it as a peace offering there is little doubt that the required three-fourths of the states would have made it a part of the constitution but the south refused to halt in her rebellion and the thunder of beauregard's guns against fort sumter drove away all further thought 
or possibility of such a ratification and within four years congress framed and the same lincoln administration sent forth the amendment of eighteen sixty five sweeping out of existence by one sentence the institution to which it had in its first proposal offered a virtual claim to perpetual recognition and tolerance the new birth of freedom which lincoln invoked for the nation in his gettysburg address was accomplished End of chapter four